welcome Cornerstone. We are so delighted that you are joining us for this time of worship. We're scattered in so many different places, but we're gathered together online. And so wherever you are on this Palm Sunday, we want you to know that you belong here, that you are welcomed here. And I want to thank you for bringing the church online. When we gather like this together, we have a purpose, and that is to worship God for who he is and for what he's done. And today we worship Jesus as the one who is the greater prophet, priest, and king. In fact, that's the series we're beginning today. It's just a little mini series during Holy Week. And as I said, today is Palm Sunday. And so Sheldon's gonna look at the fact that Jesus is the greater prophet. All of scripture was leading up to Jesus. So we're in this mini series called Greater and we wanna worship him, the one who is the perfect and greater prophet, priest, and king. And you'll hear more about that over this next week, but that's why we're here. I want to tell you about a couple things. The first is this. I want to thank so many of you who helped out with our Easter hunt a trunk. We had a amazing time. It was fantastic. And so thank you so much for making that happen. I love that Cornerstone comes together and makes these events possible. In fact, we couldn't do it without the whole congregation contributing in some way. And so thank you. I believe we loved our community well. And we pray that God builds connection as a result of that time. And so thank you so much. The second thing I want to tell you is because this is Holy Week, this is Palm Sunday, that means Monday, Thursday is this coming Thursday. And we are going to have a special online uh, Monday, Thursday service. It will premiere on this YouTube channel at 7 p.m. And so mark your calendar, 7 p.m. And we are actually going to partake of the Lord's Supper together. And so you want to be sure to get your elements ready, your bread and your juice uh, together. So you're ready to go when we get to that part of the service. Again, it's this coming Thursday night at 7 p.m. It will premiere on YouTube, this channel. And so we hope that you will join us for this special service as we gather and remember what Jesus has done for us. Well, because it's Palm Sunday, we thought it was fitting for us to call one another into worship with these words. And so I'll begin and then together we'll respond. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord.
gather on this Palm Sunday to declare Hosanna, to praise Jesus for who he is, for what he's done. And that word Hosanna has so much meaning packed into it. In fact, it originally comes from a Hebrew word in Psalm 118. It's the only time it shows up in scripture. And it literally means, save me, help me. The picture here is as if somebody's getting pushed into a pool and they can't swim and they're floundering around and they're saying, help me, save me, because I'm drowning. It has that kind of picture. But over time, the word kind of changed and rather than just simply a save me, help me, it moved into the territory of a shout of hope, meaning salvation. And it was this praise and this declaration to God. It was a shout of hope for salvation that God would rescue his people. Well, the Jesus then comes into Jerusalem riding on that donkey and they shout Hosanna. It is a shout of hope, a shout for salvation. And so we wanna continue in this time of worship remembering what Jesus has done for us to rescue us. It is his life, his death, and his resurrection that rescues us, that brings to us salvation itself. And so we wanna read together a declaration of truth, a declaration of our faith, and it's called, Our World Belongs to God. I'm gonna read the first part that actually looks at Jesus's life and how that saved us. And then together we will declare Jesus's death and resurrection. And so I'll begin and then we'll read together. As the second Adam, Jesus chose the path we had rejected. In his baptism and temptations, teaching and miracles, battles with demons and friendships with sinners, Jesus lived a full and righteous human life before us. As God's true son, he lovingly obeyed the Father and made present in deed and word the coming rule of God. And let's read this together. Standing in our place, Jesus suffered during his years on earth especially in the tortures of the cross. He carried God's judgment on our sin. His sacrifice removed our guilt. God raised him from the dead. He walked out of the grave, conqueror of sin and death, Lord of life. We are set right with God, given new life and called to walk with him in freedom from sin's dominion. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this amazing news, for this amazing grace that you drew near to us through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. We enter into this week, this holy week, with hearts that are filled with gratitude as we think about what you have done for us, that Jesus entered into this broken world, the brokenness that we still feel as we read the headlines, as we hear the news, we are reminded that our world is broken. And it is in need of the rightful king. And Jesus 2,000 years ago came. And he came to deal with our brokenness on a personal level. Also on a corporate level. And he dealt with our brokenness, our sinfulness, our foolishness on the cross to be our greater prophet, priest, and king. And he rose from the dead, conquering death. And he, as he rose, held the very keys to hell itself. And he is the one that rescues us from the separation we deserve, the separation from you. And because of what he has done and when we trust in him and in his work, we will be with you forever and ever. We will encounter eternal life. And that eternal life doesn't just begin when we die. No, that eternal life begins right here and right now as you change our hearts and make us more and more like Jesus so that we can be agents of this good news, this glorious news that this world needs as we point others to the fact that Jesus has come, that Christ has died and he has risen and there's a day coming where he will come again. And so we pray that all of these truths wouldn't just be in our minds, but you would allow them to sink deeply into our hearts so that they would then sink deeply into our bones and we would live out this faith that you have given to us. So we ask now, give us the ears to hear your word and give us the courage to do what it says. We pray all of this in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, you all know that I'm a hockey fan because it's the greatest sport on earth. And I grew up watching the game and playing the game. And there's been great debate over who is the greatest hockey player to ever play the game. Some will say it's Gordie Howe and some will say the honor belongs to Bobby Orr. Or if you're a Pittsburgh fan, and I know that there are some of you around here, and you're going to say it's Sidney Crosby or Mario Lemieux. They were great, but there's only one called the great one. That's right, the greatest of all time, the GOAT of hockey, is Wayne Gretzky. There's no doubt about it, he broke the record book. He's the leading goal scorer, leading assist producer, and the leading point scorer in NHL history. He's the only player to total over 200 points in one season, and he accomplished it four times during his career. At the time of his retirement in 1999, he held 61 NHL records. But over time, he will be replaced by others. Many of his records will fall and a new goat will arise. Gretzky's career was quite an accomplishment in the hockey world, but in the grand scheme of things, hockey is rather trivial when it comes to talking about greatness. It is secondary, it's just entertainment and sport. But when we read the scriptures, we're told that there is one who has come that has turned the world upside down. And if you listen to him and if you follow him, he will completely transform you and turn your world upside down for the good, because he's truly the greatest of all time. The Bible begins with a story that tells us that God created the world and everything in it. And God created mankind, making them male and female and entered into relationship with them. And God told them to listen and to obey his words and it would lead to life, but Adam and Eve failed. Instead of believing in God, their tragic rebellion put their trust in themselves and listened to their own voice instead of God's voice. They ignored the authority of God and the fall of mankind entered into the world. Sin began to wreak havoc in every area of life, but God's response was to then send prophets and priests and kings to call us back to God. They would call Israel to listen and to follow God's word. So God called Abraham and Moses to be prophets for him, and the Lord spoke through them, and they delivered God's word to us, and that's what it means to be a prophet. And in the New Testament, Peter teaches us that no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The prophets didn't speak by their own authority. They spoke from God, and they called God's people to listen and obey the maker of heaven and earth. These prophets and priests and kings would point us toward the day when the true prophet and the true priest and the true king would come. They were pointing our hearts toward Jesus so that we would see his greatness and that we would understand, as Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 1, he said, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. He might have first place in our lives. That's the message of the Bible. Jesus is greater than anything this world has to offer, and he is to reign and rule in our hearts as our prophet and priest and king. If you've ever read the letter to the 
book of Hebrews, you will see that the entire letter is proclaiming that Jesus is greater. Greater than the angels, greater than Abraham, greater than Moses, greater than any of the priests. The author of Hebrews is mesmerized by Jesus, and he can't imagine anything or anyone better. Jesus is the greatest of all time. He's greater than the prophets of old. He's greater than the angels. He's greater than the priests. He's greater than all the kings that ever lived. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So listen to the introduction to the book of Hebrews. It's found in chapter 1. It says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He's spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed to be heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purifications for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name He has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Did you hear that? Jesus is much superior. Jesus is more excellent. Jesus is greater, and all of Scripture testifies to it. Well, during Holy Week, we're going to look at the greatness of Christ by looking into the Old Testament and learning from the prophets and the priests and the kings in order to understand that Jesus is worthy of all of our worship and adoration because there is none like him. He's the final prophet and the final priest and the final king. We need no other because only through Him will we find truth and only through Him will we find the way to God and only through Him will we have life. We need to go back to the Old Testament of the prophets in the, and look and see and understand what it means for Jesus to be our greater prophet. I want us to look at Moses because the Bible tells us that there was no greater prophet than him. Moses was the covenant mediator because through Moses, God gave his people the law that was embodied in the Ten Commandments. And Moses became a model prophet, and all the prophets in the Old Testament are measured by their likeness to him. It says so in Deuteronomy chapter 4. It says, Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all these miraculous signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to his whole land, for no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. Well, you're familiar with the life of Moses. He's a type of Christ in the Old Testament. Just like Jesus, Moses has had to flee as an infant as he was put into a basket and floated down the river. And just like Jesus, he would perform many miracles. He would turn water into blood, just like Jesus would turn water into wine. And he was used by God to rescue his people out of the bondage of slavery. And like Jesus, Moses would be a savior to the people of Israel. Moses would lead them out of Egypt and lead them to the promised land. But Moses was not a perfect prophet. He too, like Adam and Eve, would not listen and obey. He would not listen to the authority of God and would take matters into his own hands and strike the rock in complete rebellion to God. And that was an act of unbelief. It was just like the fall in the Garden of Eden. Mankind wants to be their own king and build their own little kingdoms. And because of his rebellion against God, Moses was not permitted to lead the people of Israel into the Promised Land. God would raise up Joshua instead, and Moses would die outside the land of promise. The failure of Moses should produce in us a longing and a desire for a perfect prophet. The failures in our own lives should do the same. When we see our own sin and how easy it is for us to commit sin, it makes us look beyond ourselves for the remedy. What should we turn to? We may put our confidence in self-help to deal with our problems and failures, but we need to turn to Jesus. We need to repent and to re believe in Him. We certainly don't want to put trust in ourselves because just like Moses and Adam and Eve and all the prophets and all the priests and kings, we are sinful people. We should know by now that we can't save ourselves. These stories of Abraham and Moses and Saul and David are reminders that we are not perfect. We're flawed people and our only remedy is a perfect savior. 
The stories of the prophets should point us to our need for Christ. He is the greater Adam and the greater Moses and the greater David. And we need a perfect redeemer, a perfect pro prophet to rescue us from our sinfulness, from our desire to listen to our own voice instead of the word of God. And Peter was in Jerusalem after Jesus departed and he was preaching to a crowd and he gave this warning in Acts chapter 3. He said, For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people, and you must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. Indeed, all the prophets from Samuel on, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days, and you are heirs of the prophets and the covenant of God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. Well, Peter was telling them that the great one had arrived in Christ. He is the one that the Old Testament was pointing to, and the Old Testament saints were longing for the coming of the Messiah, the one who would rescue them from their sin. And every Old Testament story points us to Jesus. And as the Gospels unfold, they begin with the birth of Christ and how the angels of heaven announced his coming. Heaven opened and Christ came down with the fanfare of angels and was born in Bethlehem. This was no ordinary birth. This birth would mark all of history. And when his public ministry began, he was anointed by the Holy Spirit, just like every prophet and priest and king were anointed. And he was led into the wilderness for 40 days and was tempted by the devil. And just like Adam and Eve, Jesus was tempted to listen to another voice and follow a different authority. But with each temptation, Jesus responded with the word of God. Just like the prophets, Jesus spoke with authority with God's words. And while Adam remained silent, the second Adam did what the first Adam could not do. He stood firm and he endured the temptation. He was the one true prophet who did not fail the test. He was sinless and that enabled him to be the perfect sacrifice for our sin. He is the perfect priest. His triumph over temptation would be our reward. So let there be no question in your mind about who Jesus is. All of scripture testifies to his greatness and all of scripture points to him. When Jesus preached, he preached with authority, calling people to live for God and to trust in him. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount that we talked about last week, it tells us how the people responded to his teaching. It says, when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. He was not like any other. He was greater. And they marveled, they were astonished, and they began to have reverential fear in Christ. They were amazed at his power. And each gospel is full of the stories to show us that he was and is greater. Listen to the story from Luke chapter 7. It said, Soon afterward, he went to the town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. And as he drew, drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up to and touched the coffin, and the bearer stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited us, his people. And this is the report about him spread through the whole of Judea and the surrounding country. And Jesus displayed his power and authority in ways people had never seen before. He can speak and make the dead come to life. This wasn't the first time he did it. It was not the last either. And this was a regular occurrence in the life of Christ. There was no one like him. Tim Keller said, Jesus Christ doesn't just bring us truth. He is the truth. Jesus Christ doesn't just tell us how to live. He is the life. And Jesus Christ doesn't just give us God's word. The Bible says he is the word. So what does it mean for us? How do we apply this idea to our lives today? Everyone worships something. 
We learned that last week. And we attempt to build our lives on things. I talked about this when we talked about money and how it can be an idol and how beauty and acceptance can be things that we pursue after. And we put our trust in these things and we hope that these things will bring us the joy that we are looking for. But we know that the joy will never be satisfied by these things. They may do so temporarily, but all these things will crumble and have not, no lasting value. Jesus comes to us and invites us to build our lives around him and to put our complete trust in his ways. He is the truth that we're looking for. And he is the way that we need to follow. And he is the life that we have to always hope for. This is the story of the Bible. The authority of Jesus is on every page. He can speak and the wind obeys his voice. He can call your name and Lazarus rose from the dead. And he speaks the words and the demons even follow his commands. Well, our culture speaks at us and tempts us to follow its ways. It tries to seduce our hearts to listen to a different voice. Well, there are many voices that are tempting us to follow, but Jesus stands in stark contrast. He calls us to follow him, to not put our trust in our own authority. Adam and Eve tried it and look what that did. Jesus comes into the world as a prophet for our time, and he alone has the power to transform us and change us into the people that we were meant to be. We are to listen and obey and to submit ourselves to Christ. Have you ever done that? Have you said, Jesus, I surrender. I give my life to you. Well, this is what he calls us to do, and this is why he came. He came to rescue you. And when you become a Jesus follower, you will submit yourselves to his authority and you will listen and obey his words. We also become a prophet ourselves because we are told to go and tell the message. We speak the words of Christ into our culture and we call our neighbors and friends to stop trusting in their own power and relying on their own authority. And we tell them that Jesus is worthy of all of their worship and adoration because there is none like him. And we proclaim the life-transforming word of God to one another and to a lost generation. And when we gather every week for corporate worship, we gather to listen to God and to hear the prophet Jesus speak. And then we scatter to spread God's word in every aspect of our lives. You see, there's no gap between Sunday and Monday. You worship God through your work and where you live and where you play. And just as the prophets of the Old Testament pointed to Jesus, you too live your life the same way. You live to know him and to make him known. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, as we focus today on understanding that Jesus is our great prophet, we thank you that he is to be our authority in life and that his words bring us true life. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us not to listen to the voices of our times, the voices of our culture, but instead we would listen and obey to your word and seek to live it out every day of our life. And, Father, that we would see that our vocation and what we do every day is a way that we worship you and a way that we can tell others about you. And would you give us the confidence to speak and to tell and to show the authority that Christ has in this world, reminding the world that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he reigns and rules over this earth. And so, Father, would you use us to be your spokespeople, to be your prophets in this day, so that the world will know the good news that is found in him, and that they would see that he is the great one who has come. He's greater than anything this world has ever seen, and that they would surrender their lives to them. And Lord, if there's anyone who's listening today, would you point them to their need of you if they don't understand you and don't know you? And may they surrender their life to you and realize and make Christ king of their life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Beholding your beauty is all that I long for To worship you, Jesus, is my soul desire But this very heart has been shaped for your pleasure 
purpose to lift your name high Here in surrender and pure adoration I enter your courts with an offering of praise I am your servant come to bring you glory As is fit for the work of your hands Sing this, now unto the Lamb Unto the Lamb who sits on the throne Be glory and honor and praise All of creation resounds with the song Worship and praise Him, the Lord of Lords Your Spirit now living and dwelling within my eyes fixed ever on Jesus' face Let not the things of this world ever sway me I'll run till I finish the race Sing now unto the Lamb Now unto the Lamb Who sits on a throne Being glory and honor and praise All of eternity Song, worship and praise Him, Lord. Sing that again. Now unto the Lamb who sits on a throne, be glory and honor and praise. All of eternity echoes the song. Worship and praise Him, Lord of Lords. again hold Thursday, we'll be broadcasting our Monday Thursday service on YouTube for you, and we'll continue to, by looking at Jesus as our great priest. And then on Easter Sunday morning, we invite you to join us in person, if you can, at either 9 or 11 to celebrate Jesus as our King of Kings. For those of you who can't join us, we'll continue to broadcast on YouTube at 10 o'clock. And as we close this morning, we've been reminded that Jesus provides life-changing grace and mercy. And he calls us to follow him, to turn from the voices of our culture and tune our hearts to the one true voice that satisfies. Well, may you hear his words today and faithfully follow him. Thank you for joining us and we hope to see you next Sunday.